Hello, and welcome to episode 44 of Let's Talk Immigration. Um, I've got a few things I want to discuss today. Um, I'm going to start with the DV program for 2023. Um, we have lots of news about the DV program for 2023. Um, so let me share my screen with... Um, First, let's start with what the State Department is telling the public. Um, this was an update today on the Visa News website that says, Update on Diversity Visa DV Program 2023. Um, they have, as everyone expected, they have far exceeded uh expectations and issued, um, as everyone expected, they've exceeded their expectations. Okay, the sentence did not make sense. As we saw coming, they are issuing uh, the entire 55,000 visas too soon, I guess. I guess it's okay. But it's not okay for those people that have not been issued or that were scheduled and now their interviews have to be canceled after they've already traveled or paid for their medical exam. I mean, they've kind of been scammed and, and it, it makes me angry. The problem is the State Department should have never over-selected. You know, they only have 55,000 visas and they go over-select twice as many. And the reason they say they do that, they have it on their website, because they realize this is a public relations problem, what's happened here today. Um, they say, this is done to ensure that we are able to uh, issue the maximum number of visas available under the DV program in a, in a given year. You know, they could do that with selecting 65,000. They don't have to select 115,000 DV 2023 applicants. They didn't have to do that. What they did is they created false hope, and it's wrong. And Secretary Blinken, somebody needs to ask him about it. I, I try to get the press to do it. I don't know if they will. Um, someone needs to ask Biden about it because the State Department is going to be canceling over 10,000 interviews. Um, it's actually 4,000 families, but about 10,000 applicants. Um, in the next few days, they're going to cancel all those interviews that were scheduled for uh, the remainder of September. And it's very frustrating for those families. They've sort of been tricked and they've been robbed. They've been misled. Um, I don't have a litigation solution. I just want to make sure this doesn't happen again. And so that's why I'm talking a lot about it. Okay. Um, so, so a little bit of details about the announcement that's here. Um, they say that as of yesterday, there have been over 54,000 issuances and, and adjustments. So they only have 833 visas to uh, use today. So they've probably already used them all maybe tomorrow. Um, of course, they had already canceled interviews in Algeria, and it appears Nepal, well, it says we are approaching these caps in some countries such as Algeria and Nepal. Well, they had already canceled interviews in Algeria. I didn't know about Nepal until I saw this. But um, basically, if you're a DV 2023 selectee and you have not been scheduled for an interview, your journey is over. It would take a, a, a miracle at this point, and miracles don't happen in the immigration space very often at all. Um, something, it, the only thing that they put on their website that's very misleading, it says, this includes potentially canceling visa interview appointments. Potentially? I mean, there are 4,000 DV cases that say ready on SEAC right now. That means that they've been scheduled for interview. They've got 4,000 families who've been scheduled for interview, and they think that they're going to potentially cancel their interviews. No, they have to cancel their interviews. They put the word potentially there because they don't want to look like what they, they, they don't want the shame of what they've just done. It is very difficult for families in the global South to come up with $300 for a medical exam for especially for large families, to travel to third countries, you know, like they have to do from Sudan and Somalia and Yemen um, and Iran. Um, they have to travel to another country for their interviews. That's a very difficult. That is a huge burden to put on anybody, much less um, some of the 
people that are facing extraordinary economic hardships already. So I think Secretary Blinken should be fired. I know I've said that before, but today I feel stronger about it. Okay. So um, I will share one more thing about this particular issue, and that is uh, this is something that the U.S. Embassy Nairobi put out that says they've nearly reached its annual limit, and it's estimated that it will close as soon as September 7th, which is tomorrow. So um, U.S. Uh, Embassy Nairobi has a little bit more courage than the State Department, who did not go out on a limb and actually say September 7th on their website. Um, so they're warning people that if you um, complete your medical exam, it does not guarantee you a visa interview. No, it doesn't. Um, I, th I think they should have used harsher language. This They should have told people don't do it. Um, if you choose not to complete your medical exam, no additional action is due on your part. If you still choose to complete the medical exam, you will not be re reimbursed the fees and U.S. Embassy cannot guarantee that your appointment will be honored. That's an understatement. It's very true. But I'm glad that U.S. Embassy Nairobi, I'm, I'm putting featuring this because it's an example of an embassy communicating with the best knowledge that they have with the people that they serve. It's one of 180 embassies. The rest of them could be doing the same thing. The State Department itself, the visa office could be doing the same thing. So even though Nairobi has done... Um, a bad job generally with visa issuances this year. Uh, I want to say that's great that they're at least communicating to people. That's good. Okay. Um, next thing I want to talk about is a, um, there's a lot of talk lately about how immigrant visa applicants and non-immigrant visa applicants too are getting the DS-5535 form at like record, uh, the form is being used a lot. Like every immigrant needs a national security vetting, especially from certain countries that are Muslim majority. Um, and I don't know how we got here. I don't think this form is even necessary. I started doing research. I did a Freedom of Information Act request that I submitted yesterday, trying to get at a report that Biden ordered about the DS-5535 in 2021. I've never seen this report, so I did a Freedom of Information Act request for it. In a couple months, I'll litigate that. Hopefully, I'll get the report by the summer. But um, when I was um, – actually, this just came to me. Um, I was talking about, this is the blog on the Morrison Urena website. If you go to morrisonurena.com, you can click on uh, more and then blog. And I posted this today, um, 13 pages of reasons why the form DS-5535 is bad. These are not 13 pages of reasons that I think it's bad. This is a document from 2017 when the Trump administration first decided, hey, with these immigrants that we can't trust, let's get their social media. Uh, okay. That was alarming to people in 2017. And so um, there are, I think, 33 groups. Here, I'll go to the end of it here. Uh, I know CARE is one of them. The Yemen Peace Project, Restore the Fourth, um, Center for Media and Justice, Advocates for Youth. Lots of organizations, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, were saying this DS-5535 is not a good idea. So this isn't, if you think it's it's kind of dumb now, you're not the only person that thought this. Lots of people told the Trump administration that this was dumb. Um, here are some of the reasons. The expedited review of the proposed collection is unwarranted. Like they said, it was a rush that they had to get this form in use as soon as possible. It's crazy. The proposed collection ex excessively burdens visa applicants. It does. I mean, here you're going to an interview. You think you're going to be issued a visa. And it's like, no, 
you've come to the interview. Now let's do the real vetting after you've already got your 221G refusal. Now we'll really go in to look into what we really want to see. Um, it's very discouraging. Okay. The information requested will be difficult to compile and verify. Yes, it is difficult to try to go back and find your MySpace password, you know, from 2005. Um, the request for social media information is ambiguous. I agree with that 100%. I remember for years, people were not sure whether or not to list Telegram and WhatsApp handles. And, and actually, I've seen interpretations both ways that say list them or don't list them. Um, the pro proposed collection will capture information that is difficult to interpret and chill free expression. Yeah. Are you going to post bad things about the United States, even when the United States does bad things? If you know that the consulate officer is going to be looking at your Facebook? I mean, no. Here, here the U.S. is supposed to be this country with the First Amendment and like freedom of speech. And we are actually chilling free speech for hopeful immigrants. Um. I'm at war with the DS-5535 form, if you didn't know that. The proposed collection will primarily burden Muslims. This is true. And this was a prediction in 2017, and it's exactly what's played out. Um, this form is used predominantly for Muslim-majority countries. So um, there's no evidence that foreign visitors pose a significant threat to the United States. I would agree with that. So um, okay, what are we doing here now? We're gonna stop this screen share. I'm gonna stop ranting about the DS5535, except for one thing. Um the DS5535 form is not gonna go down by itself. It's they're not gonna just the Biden administration is not gonna wake up and decide to be uh, honorable with respect to immigrants. It's going to take litigation, um, probably group litigation, maybe class action. Um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, group litigation right now and like whether or not a family should do an individual mandamus lawsuit or a group mandamus lawsuit. And I have some general thoughts to share for when you are in that situation of trying to decide whether to do a group lawsuit or an individual lawsuit. I wonder if I can make it bigger. Yeah, so there's pros and cons, okay? With an individual lawsuit, pros, it's easy for the government to go away just by providing what we are asking for, okay? Um, that is happening less now than ever before because of the volume of mandamus lawsuits has caused the State Department to take what's called a, a posture that they want to fight more. Well, for firms like mine, that's fine. We like to fight, but um, it is unfortunate for immigrant families. Um, and it is unfortunate for um, immigrant families who want to file a mandamus lawsuit and not fight back. Um, if, if you have like a tight budget, you know, um, it's unfortunate. Okay, so another uh, pro with an individual lawsuit, I'm talking about a con, well, I'm supposed to be talking about pros. Um, the complaint can be tailored to your specific delay. If your uh, petitioner has cancer or a problem pregnancy or your beneficiary is soon to be inscripted into the Russian army or something, we can tailor the facts of the complaint. We can put those in the complaint and they can weigh in on what's called the track factors and they can influence the outcome of the mandamus lawsuit. Um, third thing, more discreet. We don't share filings online on our website and social media when it's an individual lawsuit. A lot of people ask me um, what happened with a specific individual lawsuit. I don't know. I don't tell them. And the reason is because that's attorney-client privilege between me and that client. Um, so group lawsuits, it's not the same. Okay. Cons, bad things about individual lawsuits. They're more expensive. Um, we can't do as aggressive motion practice. You can't do a, a motion for temporary restraining order with, you know, 50 exhibits and all that. Uh, it's, it would be too, too expensive. Um, unless you want to pay a lot of money. Um, 
you can't benefit from the hardship arguments of other plaintiffs. Um, I've done a lot of group lawsuits, and so has uh, my law partner. Um, Morrison Green has done a lot of group lawsuits. And one thing that we've learned is when you put a group of 20 people together, um, one of them has a story that really is compelling. I mean, they all have collectively stories that are compelling in the aggregate, but one of them is always like really compelling. Um, a minor child is involved. Somebody's sick. You know, um, there's, you don't even have to look for the story. It always presents itself with an individual lawsuit. Um, you don't always have that story. So it's, it's harder to paint a picture that can win the day in court. Right. So, so, uh, group lawsuits, there's also pros and cons. Okay. Group lawsuits are more affordable than individual lawsuits. We can do more aggressive motion practice because there's more people pitching in to pay us. So we can have more attorneys working on the case. Um, you're more likely to benefit from news and publicity about the lawsuit. Um, I regularly send out press releases. I send out one today. And when we have group lawsuits, um, sometimes we can get publicity. We can get journalists writing about a story. When journalists write about a story, that means judges have an opportunity to learn about the case outside of court. You know, um, it means the defendants have a opportunity to learn about the case outside of court. Consular officers can learn about the case during outside of court. Um, it's very common for a case to get media attention and then to get progress um, um, with the adjudication of visas. So media attention is a good thing. And with group lawsuits, we're, we're able to do that better. A con for a group lawsuit? Um, it's difficult for the government to make the case go away because it would take a lot of resources to adjudicate every single plaintiff's visa. And then even if they do that, there's the risk, like in the Amakarmi case, not my case, but a DB 2017 case, where the plaintiff's counsel can just say, okay, well, we want to amend our complaint and add other plaintiffs. So it's hard to make a group lawsuit go away for the government. And because of that, they're less effective at getting individual relief for plaintiffs. Um, okay, group lawsuits require us to tie the, the challenge to an unlawful action by the government defendants, and that's not always easy. In the case of DS-5535, there's a few legal theories that are floating around, but basically we have to challenge the use of the DS-5535 as unlawful um, the, there's, there's lots of ways to talk about it where logically it's not, it doesn't make any sense because of these adjudication, they don't give that form until after the interview. So how could they collect and consider that information for the interview? Um, it's almost like they're playing a little trick, right? With words. So, um, If anybody's going to do a group lawsuit for DS-5535 challenge, though, make sure that they do have a legal theory. They're not just putting a bunch of group of people together going to court because it because you're going to need to tie those plaintiffs together with a challenge of an unlawful action um, whenever you have a group lawsuit. OK, and the third thing is group lawsuits. We're bound to fight for what's best for all plaintiffs. Sometimes that's not what's best for every individual plaintiff. But it's rare that that comes up. But when it does come up, it's very awkward. Um, okay. I'll stop sharing the screen there. Thank you for letting me talk about the pros and cons between an individual mandamus lawsuit and a group lawsuit. Also, thank you for letting me talk about the DB 2023 program. And am I out of things to talk about? One quick thing I saw before I hopped on that a judge has ordered, uh, Texas Governor Abbott has to move his stupid killer buoy things that are in the river that uh, are designed to cause migrants to be injured and maimed and die. Um, that's good. It's good to see a federal judge um, make the world a little bit better and uh, put Governor Abbott in his place. So, 
in the immigration world, I'm sure that there's lots of other things going on because there are always other things going on. But I got all that out of my system. So let's see what your questions are. If you have questions, by the way, the best place to ask are on Facebook, are on YouTube, or there's a place in Telegram that I'm not sure how to get to it. But if you can get there and write a question there, uh, my, someone on my team will copy it for me to see. Nassib says, how about winners? How about those DV 2021 winner plaintiff? Good luck. I think that they're great. I think your question is, do I have an update for them? The answer is no. We are waiting for the outcome of the appeal. Okay. Yoel says, I have a family in DV 2020 appointed to Addis Ababa Embassy, but have temporarily moved to Dubai until things become peaceful in Ethiopia. Is it better to switch to Dubai Embassy or keep in Addis? Okay. Um, thanks for the question, y'all. So family is Gomez class members. Um, we are waiting for the outcome of the appeal in the Gomez case. Um, since we won summary judgment, that's all we're waiting for. Once we have the outcome of the appeal, if we win, um, then those 9,095 visas, Gomez visas can be issued rather, rather quickly. However, U.S. Embassy Addis Ababa is not where I'd want to be to get one of those visas simply because it doesn't have the capacity to um, to crank out a lot of visas very quickly. Um, Abu Dhabi would be a little better, but not ideal. Uh, that embassy has a huge backlog in many visa categories and is not particularly known for doing high volume on short notice. So... Um, you have a tough situation, but I think they're better off in Dubai than in Ethiopia. And there's nothing you can do right now. You can't contact the State Department and um, change the interview location. Not There's nothing you can do to a Gomez class DV 2020 visa application until we win the, the appeal. And if we win the appeal, no reason to contact KCC because those cases have already been deployed, deployed is the word, to embassies, but the embassies can't access some of them yet. They're on the embassy computers, but the embassies can't access them. Somebody has to run some code or something after we win the appeal, and then the embassies will be able to access, access some. It's very important that we don't make things harder for ourselves, and I bring that up because I understand a lot of DV 2020 and DV 2021 selectees are sending inquiries to KCC and to individual embassies. Don't do that. There's nothing they can do until the outcome of the appeal. And when the, the, there is an outcome of the appeal, I will tell you, I'm not going to keep it a secret. Okay. So unless I get hit by a truck, um, keep coming back. I'll let you know. Abdallah says, what about 2021? I absolutely hate this question because it's very vague. The majority of the DV 2021 selectees, their journeys ended on October 1st, 2021. The journeys that did not end are the good luck plaintiffs and the DV 2021 selectees who were waiting interviews at the embassies that were given relief from the Ray order by Judge Chutkin. So if you hope to benefit from the Ray order or the good luck order, you should be asking about Ray or good luck. You should not be asking about 2021. Okay. Eduardo says, hello, Mr. Curtis. I just want to ask what you could have given us the DV program reports 2020. Hello, Eduardo. I do not understand your question. Ask again. Um, I only speak English, sorry. I don't have a translator here. Um, and this course will soon be here. It's the end of the fiscal year. What do you think about DB 2020? I think the end of fiscal year 2023 is not relevant to DB 2020. So trying to take one thing and another thing and say, hey, how is this thing relative to this, this thing? How are these related? They are not related, you know, not related at all. 
uh, is DB2021 dead? End of story. Rowan, if you were not a good luck plaintiff or could benefit from one of the embassies itemized in the Ray order, that is correct. Your journey is dead. The only journeys for DB2021 that continue are the good luck plaintiffs and the DB2021 selectees who are waiting on interviews from the embassies itemized in the Ray order. Okay, getting some repeat questions. I'm going to skip over. I see Michelle is asking a question in French, and my French is not what it used to be. Um, je regret, uh, je ne parle pas français bien. Um, hi, Curtis. Thanks for all you do. Question about the case transfer process. As mentioned, Islamabad Embassy has a huge backlog and recommend doing a case transfer to another country if they can move. You recommend? Yes. Yes, I definitely recommend. U.S. Islamabad is probably one of the top three embassies in the entire network as far as backlogs concerned, if not the worst. I need a break to drink some water. The problem, Nasheed, is I get this question from people who have not explored their options. So, like, what are the options? Okay. Um, if your only option is Abu Dhabi, it's not much better. It's better, but not much better. I don't know if it's worth the travel. Um, if you have, if the option is Europe or uh, embassy in South America or even Africa or Asia, you're better off, uh, especially Europe. Because visa, visa, consulates and embassies in Europe do not have immigrant visa backlogs like we see in the Middle East and some African countries. Um, and of course, Islamabad. I guess, yeah, I shouldn't consider Islamabad Middle East. I guess, I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble on that no matter what I say. So, um, if a beneficiary, beneficiary gets a work visa and moves there, transfers the case and gets a U.S. visa approved, can they just leave the job in that new country and move to the U.S. without penalty and issues? Um, I practice law in the United States, so I can talk about U.S. law. Let's say you're talking about Spain, for example, um, because I do have an attorney in Spain that I recommend who does what's called nomad visas to Spain. That's sort of what you're talking about. Um, in that situation, ah, let me see if I can, I'm going to go ahead and plug his name. If I can get Roberto de la Canal. He's in Madrid. He is a great attorney. If you are doing, um the nomad visa to spain um he would be the person to ask your answer your questions about what spanish law is because you're wanting to you're to asking a question about complying with spanish law and i can't answer that question um as long as i mention roberto de la cana saying his name right de la canal um he mentioned to me today that the um Okay, so there's a law in Spain called like the law of democratic memory that I don't know how to say it in Spanish. It, it's where if you are a descendant of your parents or your grandparents were have Spanish citizenship, then you could get Spanish citizenship. That's going to end soon. And so he told me if I knew anybody that could potentially qualify for that, because sometimes people have a grandparent that's from Spain that was a Spanish citizen. If that's your situation and you want that Spanish citizenship, tick-tock, you need to do that really soon. Get with me and I'll connect you with Roberto. Okay. James says, please text your WhatsApp number. I lost my phone. James, how could you lose my WhatsApp number? Everybody knows my WhatsApp number. I'm putting it down here. WhatsApp, um, it's the same as my cell phone. It's one. 714-661-3446. I have shared it in the chat. 
Um, I only usually get to people's WhatsApp messages once a day because I answer them in order, unread messages in order. So um, don't send a message that says, hello. Go ahead and type the next sentence. Say, hello, I am a blank plaintiff. I am case number uh, RUO76, whatever. Give as much information in your first message as you can so that when I get to it, I can respond substantively. Um, oh, here's a translation of an earlier question that confused me. Um, and us, the DV2021, DV, okay. So it's really over despite our expenses. Mr. Curtis, please make sure to provide us with a favor while I come to recover from this broken heart. I never said DV 2020 is over. I said DV 2021 is over if you were not a good luck plaintiff. If you were not a good luck plaintiff, I don't know why you thought your journey continued or, or that you could benefit from the Ray order past October 1st, 2021. No one ever, no one ever said that you your journey would continue. But but if you are a good luck plaintiff, your situation is different. That's why you can't ask a question without adding context, more information about what your situation is. Okay. Omar says, how can judges decide priority other cases than us? Most of people talking about criminal cases, but we are mostly 20,000 people still waiting one year. How fair is that? Omar, did you notice that you've not really mentioned a single case in that comparison? Like you don't, you don't know anything about the other cases that the judges are considering. You're in the worst possible position to make the judgments about what is important in the judge's docket. Um, sometimes judges have a case about like um, that involve children or that involve um democracy itself. There's there's lots of cases right now working themselves up to the courts involving how the Republicans are trying to disenfranchise African Americans, you know, keep them from voting. Like um, there are lots of federal lawsuits that have value and we are not in the best position to judge their value against each other. Okay. A lot of federal lawsuits affect more than 20,000 people. Please stop with this tone suggesting that maybe the judges are making a mistake. Because if you want to suggest judges make mistakes, they will make a mistake and you will feel it. It will hurt and it will be your fault. Okay. We do not presume that judges are making mistakes. We don't ever do that. Okay. What we do is we're patient and hope for the best. We hope that they will do the best job. Um, AV Gaming. Hi, sir. I am from Afghanistan. My case is F2A and DQ July 2020. When will I get an interview date in U.S. Islamabad Embassy Islamabad transferred November? Um, well, you will not get an interview anytime soon because your case is not current in the visa bulletin. Um, I often talk to um, F2A visa category people who do not seem to be aware that um, the visa bulletin retrogressed and not all cases that are F2A can be scheduled for interview because they're not a, a, um, available visas for those cases. I'm going to try to share my screen. I don't know how that's going to work. Right now, the September visa bulletin is there, and the October one is coming soon. You're all hot. Well, so what we got for F2A in Afghanistan, final action date, um, Afghanistan is considered the first column. It's rest of the world countries, China, India, Mexico, and Philippines are different, but F2A, January 1st, 2018. That means any case with a priority date that 
Oh, actually, you didn't give me your priority date, did you? You gave me your DQ date. Oh, I can't even answer your question because I don't know your priority date. I need your priority date. But basically, um, if your priority date is after January 1st, 2018, you can't lawfully be issued a visa right now anyway. Hopefully, the October visa bulletin will undo some of the retrogression that's happened in the visa bulletin, and that number will advance. Hopefully, someday, all these numbers in advance will advance, but they will not advance under the Secretary Blinken's current prioritization of non-immigrant visas. What I'm talking about is tourists and students. That's who Secretary Blinken prioritizes. Okay. Follow-up question. Is there a way to see what embassies have lesser backlogs as compared to Islamabad? You mentioned Europe generally, but aside from that, um, no. We are in a unique position at Morrison Arena um, because we do litigation, mandamus litigations for people from a lot of different uh, countries and backgrounds. So sometimes when the government fights us, they file a declaration that gives us insights to the size of the backlog and the staffing situations at individual embassies. So we have more knowledge than a lot of people, but we don't have knowledge about every embassy. Um, you can go to a blog entry that I wrote maybe a year ago where we did during litigation for diversity visa 2022, we were able to get the state department to, well, they volunteered it. They had a declaration with an exhibit that said, these are the backlogs of these embassies. And there was like 30 embassies and it gave a really broad spectrum of where trouble spots were, but none of those trouble spots were in Europe. That's for sure. Okay. Um, I don't have many mandamus lawsuits for people waiting for interviews from Europe, and that's because they don't have unreasonable delays. So if if it's a country that a lot of people are suing the government over, Islamabad, Ankara, Abu Dhabi, Yerevan, Montreal, Nairobi. Um, I said Islamabad, but I'd want to say it again. Islamabad, Islamabad, Islamabad. Um, then um, that's definitely not a country that you want to move your case to. Okay, I don't understand that question. Um, um, Excuse me, says how verdict final key print de Anis de DB 2020. Verdi, verdi. Um, je ne sais pas. We do not know the final outcome. News ne savons pas. I, I don't know French. Je, je ne parle pas français. We don't know the outcome of the DB 2020 Gomez case yet. We have to wait. Is there a time frame for DB 2020 and 2021 selectees to get interviews? There's not a time frame. It's not going to happen until the outcome of the appeal. Okay, Hassan, we have to wait for the outcome of the appeal. And the majority of DB 2021 selectees are not even eligible. Only the good luck plaintiffs and the Ray eligible plaintiffs. And the gold plaintiffs, but I forget to talk about them because they are not my clients. Um, Rewan says, we are all from good luck, sir, but not hearing anything about it. Rewan, I can assure you that not everyone here is from good luck. Many people are from good luck, but many DB 2021 selectees just think that they can talk about it and become good luck plaintiffs if they hang out with you. Okay. So, I'm just making sure that you understand that you can't assume, I can't make assumptions about you all. You have to give me information. And you're not hearing about anything because we're waiting for the outcome of the appeal. If we don't have information to share, I'm not going to share information. I'm not going to make information up, right? I'm not going to manufacture information. Okay. Rewan says they are letting all the illegal entries, fake asylum seekers, but not the DB winners. Rewan, sit down. You're not allowed to say that, not here, because that's not true. 
What that is, is Republican talking points um, to try to get racists to vote against Biden, okay? The reality of the border is there are more apprehensions than ever before. Um, Biden is not being friendly on any front with respect to immigration, okay? If you are saying, oh, the border's open and they're letting all these, what you're doing is you're, you're consuming fascist propaganda by the Republican Party and you're repeating it. And I don't want to hear it. It's not true, okay? People, people come to seek asylum in the U.S. at the southern border. They're, a lot of them are like actually being killed. I mean, it's a very dangerous thing to do. And then you get there and there's this app. Um, like, let's pretend like you still have your smartphone. And the app generally like doesn't let most people even access it. So um, it's not easy to seek asylum at the southern border. And if people are doing it, it's because they have reasons and we're not going to sit here and slander them. Sometimes I think I probably shouldn't be mean to people that ask questions because I want you all to continue asking questions. But I think we all learn and get smarter by asking each other questions. Sometimes you all are mean to me and you're right. So it's okay. Right? Okay. Patrick says, hi, Curtis. When would the Department of State's... Department of State released data on the number of backlog cases for each embassy. When we sue them, that's the only time they do that. Um, there is a website, if you go into Google and type visa backlog report, where they tell you how many documentarily qualified immigrant visas are waiting for interview across the whole system, but they don't break it down by embassy. We find that out in litigation. Omar wants to do a little conversation here. He's coming back and he says, no, I didn't say judges make mistakes on us, but you know, your situation is very bad. We are waiting four years and even we win, we have only 30% chance to get to an L. It's bad when you think about it. Uh, when you think about it that way, it is bad, but that's not judges, okay? That's not the three judge panel. Well, Judge Mehta is the one that did that little lottery within a lottery selection of 9,095 or 6914, whatever. So I, I hear you on that part. But when is it ever good in your life if you think about all the bad thoughts you can? If you think all the bad thoughts you can, you put them in a bucket and you just decide to think about them, it's not good. Okay, so let's stay positive. We don't know the outcome of the appeal yet. So that means we don't know bad things. We don't know good things. We don't know bad things. It's neutral. We don't know anything. So Let's focus on other things. Omar says, I'm happy that we have judges and courts because there are people see our suffering and pain with a justice of Department of State in front of us. They have power to get our justices. I agree. That was a very good comment, Omar. Thank you. News about DV 2023. Um, Asan, go back to the very beginning of this show. I talked about first five minutes of the show was devoted to DV 2023. Do you know anything about care team who work to help Afghanistan people in relocation? That's not my specialty. I do not. I saw you ask another question about that above it. I didn't understand it. And now I know why. It's because I don't... Um, practice in the SIV space or the Afghan refugee space. Um, I'm not the best person to ask those questions. Nash Diz says, any updates on the Veed versus Blinken progress or regarding the plaintiff cases interview scheduled, if able to share, realize it might be confidential. Well, the Veed's a group lawsuit. And on group lawsuits, I tend to, uh, since they impact policies, I tend to share more information with group lawsuits. So. Um, in the David case, the government filed a motion to dismiss. We filed a response to the motion to dismiss, and the government filed a reply. And we are waiting for the judge to issue an order on the government's motion to dismiss. Um, what's interesting to me is that 
There was an order in Sunny Santos and Wilson, three cases that we also represent in the Eastern District of New York last week, last Wednesday, I believe, that those cases were dismissed and they shared a legal theory with Naveed. Um, yet, the State Department, the Department of Justice has not entered that order as a supplemental authority. And I wonder if it's because there's something in that order that doesn't work for them in Naveed. They haven't shared it in Iqbal either, the other case for Pakistani our ones that's in the Eastern District of California. So I'm watching to see what happens there. Um, related, I'll go ahead and mention the Iqbal case because that's also a group case like Naveed that's challenging our one delays um, not waiting for interviews at Islamabad. In Iqbal, the judge um, just advanced a status conference, made it sooner, like the status conference was going to be in December, and she moved it to October um, after the government filed their motion to dismiss. We're in the process of preparing uh, opposition to that motion to dismiss, but um, I, I just found it interesting that the judge took an interest in the case and moved that status conference. So um, if you're waiting on Islamabad and you're like, what litigation is going on out there right now? The group litigation, there's two lawsuits, Naveed and Iqbal. They're both pending. And um, actually, in the entire system that I'm aware of, those two lawsuits are the only ones that are challenging uh, Secretary Blinken's prioritization of non-immigrant visas over immigrant visas. Um, two little lawsuits. That's it. I mean, they're group lawsuits, but still, um, for the most part, he's getting away with it. Um, to the pain and detriment and injury of many, many uh, immigrant families. Okay. I'm going to promise you something. Next Wednesday, I want to be in a better mood because today I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> I've seen State Department do so many bad things lately that, uh, and you know, what I do is I sue the State Department. And so I have like so many reasons to sue them. Um, if you are thinking about suing the State Department, now is the time to do it because they deserve it. Okay. So thank you for joining um, episode 44 of Let's Talk Immigration. Hope to see you at episode 45. Have a great week.